I'm an artisan, a stone carver. I don't build stone walls, that's a mason. And I don't do uh, figurative work, statues and things, that's a sculptor. I was lucky enough to be born into a business that has specialized in the design and carving of lettering in stone since 1705, uh, the John Stevens shop in Newport, Rhode Island. The Stevens family ran the business for six generations. My grandfather bought the place in 1927. Uh, my grandfather was an artist. And when he bought the place, it was sort of heading down the road of mechanization and um, quite possibly mass production. And he took that whole approach and he just threw it right out the window. Uh, as far as he was concerned, the way to do the work was to draw the lettering by hand and carve it in stone with a mallet and chisel. My dad carried on in this vein. He took over the business in 1963. And he worked on the uh, John F. Kennedy Memorial in Arlington Cemetery and the FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C., and, and many different jobs. Um, I took over the business in 1993, and I've been at it ever since. It's a really, really great craft. I absolutely love it. Uh, but it's funny, because oftentimes today I'll hear people say that uh, high craft is lost, that fine craft is dead, and that nobody really knows how to make anything well with their hands anymore. And I think that there's some truth to that, but I think what's really lost is the mindset of what it is to be a craftsman or a craftsperson in the artisanal sense. It's not necessarily what you make, it's more about what you think and consider while you're making it. I'm really interested in the life that the artisan leads and the human pace that that process allows. Uh, pace matters. When I was a kid, I had no idea that being born into a 260-year-old uh, tradition was at all atypical. And I didn't know that my dad was the sort of same semi-famous uh, calligrapher and stone-carving guru. From my perspective, he was just this really fun-loving, uh, charismatic guy. And when he wasn't carving stone, he was always making stuff with his hands. And he would draw my brother and me into that process. And Saturdays would roll around, and my brother and I would run to my dad and we'd say, Dad, what are we going to do today? What are we going to make? And he'd say, oh, we're going to go down and we're going to cast some replica Derringer pistols in lead. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, no, we're going to run over to the beach and I'm going to carve swords for you out of driftwood. What do you want, a cutlass or a scimitar? And he would, he would do this. We'd run down to the beach and he'd grab a piece of driftwood off the shore and he'd take out his penknife and he'd make these absolutely beautiful swords for us out of wood. And he'd teach us about it. He'd say, OK, don't cut against the grain. And he'd say, draw the blade out a little further along the wood. And he'd hold up the sword, and we'd look at this absolutely beautiful surface that he'd carved with his knife. Um, my dad is an incredible craftsman. When I was 15, uh, he offered me a job at the shop, and I sort of recoiled a little bit, like, oh, no, my fate is sealed, right? Um, but he made it clear that this was not connected to any greater expectation that I had to take over the family business. Uh, but my dad was smart. He knew that I had graphic talents, and he knew that I was good with my hands. And sure enough, when I actually got into to learning how to carve lettering, it was really, really fun. I loved it. And I loved being a part of the old shop, that, that place and that pace. Be that as it may, this was not going to stop me from going off to college to be the next great fill-in-the-blank, right? And indeed, when I got to college, I jumped into a bunch of different uh, subjects, and it was really engaging. But I'd walk back and forth across campus, and there was a, an administrative building there that would give me pause. I'd stop and I'd check it out. It was a big, beautiful stone mansion. And I'd look at the way it was made, and I'd sort of consider what the craftsmen had done, how they'd, how they'd carved certain sp spots, and how they'd made that place. And in doing that, it really made me reevaluate the old family business. And I ended up uh, transferring to the School of Design in Basel, Switzerland. And there, I got an incredible foundation in calligraphy and letter form design. And then when I came back to Newport, uh, I dove into work with, with my dad. Uh, the funny thing is, is that uh, my dad is slightly uh, a bit of a curmudgeonly kind of guy sometimes. And for years, I had listened to him lament the fact that uh, mechanical processes were doomed to produce ugly and ineffective things. He'd rant about it and tear down the whole process. Uh, practically speaking, um, 
mass production and mechanization makes all the sense in the world. Um, you know, we can't exactly expect a, uh, a craftsman to weave rugs for a brand new office building, let alone have them be affordable, right? And mass production and mechanization have done so many great things for us, but I think in many ways we, we tend to apply the ideology across the board. It, it sort of becomes a, a bit of a panacea. Um, the Little John Stevens shop is a two-story building, and most of the work takes place on the ground floor. It measures about uh, 30 feet by 40 feet. And I have an old photo of the place from the 20s, about 100 years old, and I look at that photo and I look at the building today, and the two are remarkably similar. Um, there are no ancillary buildings or facilities associated with the shop today. Really, what you see is what you get. What I'm saying is, is that uh, we're not interested in growth industry. We're artisans who are dedicated to the perfection of our, our craft. So how does that affect the sort of daily pace uh, of the work? Well, at any given time, we have to take into consideration uh, the fact that we're bound by what the hand, human hand can manage. Whenever I get to a piece of stone, I have to stop. I have to consider it. I have to think, how hard is it? How soft is it? How far can I push it before it chips? or cracks. I'm just going to go on all night. Is that cool? <laughs> the thing is, is that this process becomes a kind of spontaneous dance of, of familiarity and challenge and adaptation within this tactile context. It's sort of a counter to the pace that society has set for us for the past 50 years or so. It's not that go, go, go pace. And interestingly, uh, one of the things that we do so often with our hands now is this. You know, this, this process and this interaction, um, this sort of making, if you will, is obviously tied to the digital realm. And so much of it is ephemeral. It just goes off into the ether. The other thing is it's instantaneous. You know, Slip, clack, boom, 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 on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. And it's funny because I kind of see so much of that interaction weave its way into the way people deal with the physical world. People will come into my shop and they'll say, okay, what I got is I, got a, I, I, I have a piece of slate here and I want a 15-line paragraph and can you get that for me next week? And I say, well, um, here's what we do. And I, I take them through the process. I show them the lettering. And I'll walk them into the back room of the shop. And uh, we'll look over the shoulder of a colleague of mine and we'll watch the process. And they'll say, ah, this is a t completely different process. This is a totally different pace. Uh, so just imagine when I am standing on the wall at the Martin Luther King Memorial down in Washington, DC, and there are a run of inscriptions that go the full 40, 430 foot length of the wall. And I'm about there and I'm about to carve Dr. King's immortal words into this memorial that's on the National Mall. Um, what happens if I make a mistake, <laughs> right? Well, you know, I lose my job and I have to fix the wall, right? <laughs> um, but realistically speaking, what happens is, is that, that I stand there and this is what I do. When I stand there and I think about this, what I have to do is I have to stop, and I have to slow down, and I have to consider this. And in that moment of consideration, my mind sort of opens up to the whole process. Then I can take a breath, and then I can make. Um, and all that I've just shared with you, uh, I think that maybe we could all do with a little bit more of the stop, slow down, consider, uh, and then make. Now, pace matters. Thank you so much.